Good evening. Welcome to the Independent City Council meeting. It's Tuesday, April 9th, 2019. The blossoms are out and the rain, the rain has fallen. The river is up, but it's now going down because it's all planned for. Let the record show the council members are here except for Councilor Ransom Smith, who did let us know that she was not able to join us uh, this evening. Uh, things came up and uh, she uh, let me know. Uh, council members, you have uh, meetings uh, minutes from March 12th and March 26th. Do they meet with your approval? Yes. I take that yes as a, <laughs> as a, as a motion. And I have, some, and I have a second, second from uh, Councilor Takis. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, Chief Strange, you're up. Good evening. Welcome to the Independent City Council meeting. <laughs> I appreciate that. It reminds me to put my phones on silent. So. Uh, good evening, Mayor Ricardo, uh, members of the council. My name is Ben Sang. I'm the Fire Chief of Polk County Fire District Number One, and I'm here uh, this evening because last year, when I was doing a little uh, circuit about our levy that we were going out for, uh, Sheriff Garden happened to be here on the same night, and he was doing an annual review of the Polk County Sheriff's Department because, as he explained, uh, this, the services that his people provide impact your constituents and that made a lot of sense to me so I figured I should probably uh, take note and do the same so I'm here before you tonight to talk about 2018 it's been a little bit but we've all been busy uh, a little review of 2018 I want to start with just a couple of your minutes just to give you a little history of our district in case you're not familiar with this since this is my first time uh, before you so I'm going to refer to some slides I believe you have them in a packet uh, I'm gonna look over your shoulders at the screen here so I don't look down um, but real quick, you did have a fire department, the Independent City Fire Department, for a long time. It started back in 1879 with a bunch of volunteers who put a bunch of money together and stored an engine that they bought in Mr. Butler's barn. And I'm not sure where that is, but that's what the records say. Um, eventually, the City of Independence uh, came through and purchased their own fire engine for $458 from the City of Astoria. And they started their own department. Uh, it did not go well for the city. It went terribly for the city, and so the city invited all the people from the sort of uh, club, Independent Hook and Ladder Company, to come join their department, and in return, they would get to play with this shiny new fire engine from Astoria. And so the men, and unfortunately they were all men, of Independent Hook and Ladder Company did take them up on it. So uh, things started very well for uh, the City of Independence Fire Department. In 1887, uh, you can still find the microfiche uh, newspaper articles with them saving uh, the Cooper building and they got some fantastic publicity for that so <coughs> good in fact that a couple years later when Independence built a city hall they housed the fire department in it uh, they gave money to the volunteers the first ones to come and draw the first uh, wagon out the door basically so that's uh, where it was back then uh, as time went on in 1985 the city of Independence joined with the city of Monmouth and Southeast Polk Rural Fire Protection to form what is now uh, County Fire District number one and that is the organization that I represent uh, you have a map there that shows our boundaries we have 204 square miles mostly in Polk County a little bit in Marion County uh, we kind of go up Highway 51 uh, across Greenwood Road back up Cooper Hollow we kind of uh, go through between here and Dallas uh, along Highway 223 and out in the PD area followed up uh, along the Benton County line and back along the Willamette and out River Road Riverside Drive and Skyline uh, we have four fire stations. Uh, the one you're probably most familiar with is across from Wearmark. Uh, that is Station 90. It has volunteers and career staff. We also have three other stations in the rural areas out in PD, Airlie, and Buena Vista. Our call volume uh, this last year was flat compared to 2017. 17 and 18 were flat. Prior to that, we had increased about 42%. Uh, in a five-year period which was pretty significant for us most of that increase is in EMS call volume and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment I did put an organizational chart in here uh, there's not a quiz on it I know it looks complicated but just to say we have about uh, at any given time about 50 volunteers six to nine student residents and 17 full-time employees uh, at our in our various um, uh, working capacities uh, on to the next slide, if you look at, I did run the numbers for just within the city limits of Independence for 2018. We responded within your city limits to emergencies 1,066 times. 81% of that uh, was for EMS calls, a little higher than our average in the city of Independence, uh, and a little bit higher than the national average, but not, not completely out of the norm. And the runner-up at 9% is public service. This would be things like lift assists, 
uh, helping people with oxygen tanks that they can't get working, things like that. And then uh, everything else, hazardous material, uh, fires, things like that, make up a pretty small percentage. Uh, after that pie graph, you'll see on your slides there, you have a heat map, kind of like a weather map of where most of our calls were in 2018 within your city. Uh, the, the dark red ones, I can name most of those addresses. Uh, starting from the left-hand side there, there's 141 South 17th, which is a, a, a mobile home park. Um, you can see the high school across from 1525 Mama Street, which is uh, Independence Health and Rehab. Uh, and then you can see 202 South 9th Street also, which is a memory care unit. In addition to that, you can see there are a couple of houses, uh, private residents within our fire district that we do uh, have frequent calls at. Uh, for some people with some advanced medical needs. Aside from that, uh, things are pretty dispersed throughout, throughout your community. Uh, standard of cover. So we're going to kind of get into the review. Uh, this is something that was a pretty big deal uh, when I took over uh, in August of 2017. Our fire district had never had a standard of cover. And what a standard of cover is it says what you're going to do, how many people you're going to take to do it, and how quickly you're going to get it done. Because it's not enough to just say, somebody called 911 and we went, so Congratulations, we did it. Um, this sets a little bit uh, higher standard for it. So we completed it. Basically, to do it, as you'll see, we used data from 2014, 15, and 16. And this was during the year 2017. So we compared the data. Uh, we're here to compare the data again in 2018. And then we're already kind of up for a renewal because when we're talking about statistics from 14, 15, and 16, uh, that's all we're ready quite a ways back. So uh, I'll get into it here. I apologize if I'm moving quick, but I know you have a lot on your agenda, so I'm happy to, to follow up with anything or questions at the end. Uh, the first thing that should be probably most important to, to most of the people here is I did reference that 81% of the calls in your community are for EMS. Uh, chapter 333 um, of ORS refers to pre-hospital response times. And what it says is that if you're in an urban area of Oregon, which is populations, it, I think it's 100,000 population, you should have an ambulance to your door in eight minutes, 90% of the time. If you are in a suburban area, it's 15 minutes, a rural area is 45 minutes, and frontier would be a two hour response. And these are for emergency calls, lights and sirens. We don't risk lives for cut fingers or anything else. These are strokes, seizures, chest pains, breathing problems, real things that we need to get to. And, and so if you looked at it from the state's point of view, uh, Monmouth and Independence would be a suburban area. A 15 minute response 90% of the time. Outside of our, the, your city limits, it would be 45 minutes 90% of the time. Uh, what our uh, standard of cover says is that we will meet the urban area response. That is that we will have an ambulance within the city limits of Monmouth and Independence within eight minutes, 90% of the call time for emergency calls. And what you'll see below that is a graph uh, of sort of how we've, so I know it's a lot of data on it, um, but sort of how we've performed against that. So on the left side, it says apparatus, and you can see our medic units, medic 91, 92, 93, and then cumulative. And our goal, again, is eight minutes, 90% of the time. And this last year, uh, we managed, if you look down at the cumulative, it says 93% of the time within the city limits of Monmouth and Independence, we were able to achieve that. If you look above it, and you, you will notice that it says that our apparatus, Medic 91 responded 97%, Medic 92 was 94, and Medic 93 was 100% because there weren't many calls that were emergent that it ran on. Uh, those don't add up to 93, and that's because sometimes we do get units from Salem or from Dallas, and we're out of resources. And those need to be included in the data because it's not fair to say, well, it wasn't our ambulance, so it's not our fault because it's the service that we need to be providing. Uh, so it's 93%. So we're pretty happy, happy with, with that response from the EMS side. Uh, going on to our fire response, uh, structure fires. If you read our full standard cover, which you can find at our website if uh, you want to read a big document, um, our initial effective force is to have six people on scene within nine minutes. This is in town to be able to actually do some sort of a safe interior operation on a structure fire. It's the minimum what we need. Uh, it's dependent on in-house staffing. Obviously, we can't rely on volunteers to leave their homes, drive to the station, change into their gear, get on the apparatus, and get to a fire scene in nine minutes. So it's heavily dependent on the amount of staffing that we have uh, available. And what you'll see there is in 2018, we did not meet it. Uh, we struggled to meet that one. Uh, we want that to happen 80% of the time. Uh, and we had seven uh, working structure fires in Monmouth and Independence, and five, uh, I'm sorry, four of them, we were able to, to meet that. So uh, we did not achieve our goal with our uh, initial effective force on structure fires in town. Uh, 
As far as a full effective force, following up on that, what we want is 14 people in 27 minutes. This is extremely reliant on volunteers. We don't have 14 people on shift ever. Far from it. Uh, so we need volunteers for this one. And uh, if you look at in town and out of town, we were able to meet at 50% of the time last year. An interesting note, if you go and you look down deep at it, we actually achieved 14 people in 27 minutes, 100% of the time within the city limits of Monmouth and Independence. Uh, and we were one person short, having 13 people on scene in 27 minutes uh, every time in the rural. So we did meet it in, in town, uh, which is great. Uh, we did not meet it out of town. Uh, we were just barely short on manpower for meeting that one. So if you look at those two things, EMS, we did very well. Fire, especially in the initial forces, uh, we struggled staffing-wise. Uh, fire statistics, I'll go through these relatively quickly, but we want to have fewer structure fires, less property loss, fewer civilian injuries, and fatalities than the average in the state of Oregon. The way we do that is we look at our population versus the population across the state and see how we're doing. Um, and if you look at the fire statistics on the first slide there, it says fire statistics, total structure fires. Um, and you can read down there on the, the top half of the, uh, of the graph there, it says Polk County structure fires, Polk County fire population, fires per thousand, and below is for the state of Oregon, the state of Oregon's population, the fires per thousand. And what you see is on a three-year average in the state of Oregon, there's one fire per thousand people. Within our fire district, our three-year average is about uh, 0.6, about 60% of the state. So that's good. Uh, our property loss is, in the state, it's about 40 to $45,000 uh, per thousand people population. Ours is 20 to 25,000, so it's about 45 to 55%. A lot of that you can probably contribute to the fact that we only have 60% of the fires. So we should have less property loss. That's the easiest way to save property. Uh, civilian injuries, there are about six injuries per 100,000 people in the state. Uh, we did have one injury in 2018 and one in 2017. Um, so we are uh, about, uh, we're less than half of the state's average. We're about a third of the state's average as far as uh, civilian injuries. And then fatalities, uh, about one fatality per 100,000 population in the state of Oregon. We did have a fatality in 2017 uh, and in a population the size obviously has a pretty big impact uh, statistically. So we're about 10% above the state's average uh, due to that uh, fatality. Those are very quick statistics. Uh, I want to talk to you briefly about goal setting. We just had a strategic plan approved by our board of directors last month. Uh, I won't lay out all 100 objectives, uh, but the six main goals were basically to, one, to provide consistent skill level appropriate training. We're a fire district that should be at the top of, of any fire district or fire department's uh, goals. Number two is to expand and enrich community relationships. Uh, I think I'll, I know your city knows the importance of that, so I don't need to speak much to that. Uh, the third goal is to enhance the overall morale of the organization. Uh, like the city, their staffing wise, our, our full time staff, we don't have as many opportunities. There's some wage things that we can't do that bigger places can do. So, morale is a big thing that we like to think we can offer. Also, as I said, we, and, and we have 50 to 60 volunteers at any given time, and so morale is important to keep, keep those people around. Number four, continuing to build and modify an efficient, consistent, and realistic response model. Uh, one of the things that we want to do with our plan over the next three years is to look at, you saw that heat map, and I mentioned that there are some houses, some residential areas with these big red targets on them. And uh, if we want a realistic and reliable response model, it doesn't make sense to keep throwing 911 response at these same red targets, time in and time out. Uh, it, what we need to do is build plans and systems where those people, those high needs individuals, we take a paramedic or whoever it is and, and have them meet with the CAPES worker outside of things to get long-term solutions for the health and safety. I, uh, a lot of fire and EMS people uh, take pride in increases in call volume year after year, but if our focus really is on community health and safety, that shouldn't be a point of pride that your call volume is increasing. Uh, we need to see what we can do to try to mitigate that as much as possible. Uh, convening an EMS committee to ensure that all aspects of EMS response remain efficient and effective. Again, EMS is uh, extremely important to our organization. Ensure investment in stations, apparatus, and equipment are tracked, cared for, and replaced responsibly. So um, quite, a few, quite a few goals, uh, quite a few objectives under each one of those. Uh, and that is, I know I went extremely fast, and I apologize for that, but I know you have a whole meeting ahead of you. 
I am happy to take any questions, and if I can, uh, Mayor McCardle, after any questions, I do have one more comment I'd like to make. Sure. Questions? Comments? Thank you for being so thorough. Not really a question, but thank you. You were thorough. It was quick, but clear and concise. So. I appreciate and that. And very helpful, so thank you. Thank you. You mentioned, you mentioned having a paramedic work with caseworkers for those hot spots. Do some of those people not have caseworkers? Are they in, just independent on their own, rely on the fire department for everything? Uh, no, most of them do. Okay. Um, but we, we haven't built strong enough um, cooperation with those caseworkers. And, and I think there's some opportunities there. Congratulations on winning the organization of the year. It is well deserved. Thank you very much. I uh, join with my colleagues in uh, praise of the presentation. I did want to let you know that uh, uh, mayors, commissioners, and others in the region were looking at the Highway 5122 interchange uh, because I know it has some impact on you folks. And uh, we're having some conversations. Uh, we're trying to engage ODOT because that is a a long-term problem and we recognize that uh, uh, it's stressful on uh, your folks when they have to respond and uh, when people get mushed it's stressful on people and so I just want to let you know that uh, and we'll be bringing you in engaging you as that conversation starts to, to happen but I did want to bring that up and let you know I appreciate that, that. Uh, yeah oh, it's a real it's a significant effort and governor's office is helping back to you I think well uh, just to echo on the uh, awards uh, thing I, I did want to mention to the council uh, every year our fire our fire chief gets to give their own award it's like one of these perks I guess you just get to give an award so we do you know we do top responders for our people and stuff but every year they say okay fire chief who has had a big impact that maybe other people don't realize on the fire district and um, this last year, as most of you know, uh, we laid off our full-time fire marshal in 2012. I'm extremely pleased to say that in less than two weeks, we'll have a part-time fire inspector starting, because uh, for the last six years, it has fallen on the fire chief to do those jobs. Um, I don't have a background in, uh, in inspection and plans reviews and all of that. And so for the 2018 recipient of the Chief's Award, uh, we're actually giving it to uh, Jeff Kennedy, your building inspector. He has been an enormous uh, asset to our fire district. He's been there for us consistently, uh, is extremely knowledgeable, and has really advocated for fire safety uh, and, and complying with the fire code when we don't necessarily have the staffing in-house to address all those issues. So we have used him a ton. We will use him less. Uh, we'll give him some of his time back to you. Uh, but I did want to mention that uh, he, he will be receiving that award. I've already contacted him about it, and uh, so it might be sitting on his desk. Well, thank you so much for uh, for recognizing we're we're very proud of what our employees and and what, what Jeff's done to be able to help our community and, and thank you for bringing it to our attention this evening. We really appreciate it and thank you again for taking the time. Um, we found it, I found it, an interesting presentation, helpful, and don't worry, you gave it at the speed of independence. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. We have another presentation, uh, Natasha Cronin from the volunteer recruitment. Uh, specialist, the Office of Long-Term Care for the State of Oregon. Good evening and welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Natasha Cronin, and I am the Volunteer Recruitment Specialist for the Office of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. Um, I'm here today to tell you about the work we do and the need for volunteers in your community, which also happens to be my community. Um, although the program is a state agency, our mission is accomplished through the hard work of many volunteers. The word ombudsman can be hard to pronounce. Um, it's of Swedish origin and is an English translation of the word ombuds, meaning representative. We often use it interchangeably with the word advocate. Ombudsmen are resident directed and strive to bring resolution to the concerns of the residents. The Oregon Ombudsman Program has been operating since 1981 to provide advocacy for Oregon's residents in long-term care facilities with federal and state authority under the Old Americans Act. The agency is required to provide advocacy for individuals living in licensed care settings such as nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, residential care facilities, um, adult foster homes, and endorsed memory care and answer only to the governor's office. 
The mission of the Oregon Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program is to protect individuals' rights, enhance quality of life, improve care, and promote dignity for the residents. Many residents have no one to watch over them or speak up when things go wrong. Call lights go unanswered, meals arrive cold, or medications are given incorrectly. Ombudsmen don't make decisions for the residents or act as their legal representatives or provide care. It is our role to inform the resident of their rights and then act upon their decision. So before we look at the numbers, let me clarify that the numbers I'm about to share with you do not include adult foster care homes. The state of Oregon has approximately 685 long-term care facilities housing approximately 45,000 residents. Currently in Independence, we have two licensed long-term care facilities and in Independence, we have zero ombudsman volunteers. Our neighbors, Monmouth and Dallas, respectively have five entities, none of which have volunteer ombudsmen. The need for advocates in long-term care facilities in Independence and in Polk County as a whole is immense. So what happens to our residents in long-term care facilities? The state of Oregon is divided into six districts and each district is assigned to a deputy ombudsman, which is a staff person for our agency. If a complaint comes into our office, the deputy for that district investigates the complaint. This means, however, that a complaint has to be filed in the first place. Many residents feel powerless in facilities and often fear retaliation, sometimes as severe as eviction, for speaking up. Having a local ombudsman visit a facility on a weekly basis builds trust and also enables another set of eyes to see the ongoings of the long-term care facility. So what's next? We need local residents to become certified ombudsman volunteers. Upon completion of the application, screening, training, and certification process, volunteers become authorized representatives of the state of Oregon. While our volunteers are a very diverse group, one has to be over 21 to apply, be able to pass all screening processes, including a criminal records check. We ask volunteers to commit four hours per week and give at least one year of service. We have a training coming up in Salem in May, but if we get enough people interested locally, we can host a training here. We're also excited to announce that in partnership with the Monmouth Senior Center and the Independence and Monmouth Public Libraries, we're hosting a May book club to celebrate Older Americans Month and to raise awareness about the Ombudsman Program and the need for volunteers. Independence is a place where we pitch in to help. We care about our neighbors. And we care about getting things done, which sometimes seem impossible to outsiders. It's imperative that we spread the word about the need for volunteers in our community to ensure that our neighbors, our elderly neighbors, feel their rights and dignities are being respected. Um, I thank you for your time. And if you do have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Questions, please. I do. How are the um, volunteer ombudsmen viewed by the home staff? Are they threatened by them, or are they readily accepted? Um, it depends how well the staff are doing in the facility. <laughs> um, so often, um, at first, there's a lot of education that happens, um, not just for the, the staff, but also for the residents. The residents aren't really sure what the ombudsman purpose is. Um, so there's a lot of relationship building that goes into that. Um, and then often, if there are issues in the facility, the ombudsman presence will um, improve the situation, and often then the staff and ombudsman um, get along really well. But at first, it can be a little tricky. How long is the training, Natasha? Yeah, the training is actually five days. It's uh, around 48 hours, but we spread it out over a couple of weeks because it's quite the commitment. Additional questions? Have you had a chance to um, work with local churches or relig religious groups, in maybe to get some volunteers there? Yeah, I've, um, so I've started uh, sort of over the last month um, hitting Polk County pretty hard. Um, I've been going to the SIT meetings, but I will be reaching out to the churches. Yeah, it's a great idea. Additional questions? I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share this, and I know that there are a number of people who watch us on Facebook and otherwise, so uh, I'm glad uh, we were able to help them, help the word, ex word be expanded. Yeah, thank, thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, any other visitor comment? Okay. 
I don't see any, so I'm going to uh, move forward. Um, I have a couple of things in front of you. First of all, I have a committee appointment uh, that was at your desk, uh, William uh, Boisvert. He's a retiring uh, uh, Army officer. He's a major. He uh, retires at the end of the year. He lives uh, down the street from the Archers. And I've had a visit with him, and I think he'd be an excellent person to join our budget committee. I uh, move to approve William Boisvert no. as a member of the budget committee. Second. Motion second. Discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed. Motion carries. Since we're doing appointments, also we have in the uh, packet tonight uh, an appointment for Diana Linscog to be on the, um, uh, the library uh, board. And that's a continuation just in a different role. Is that okay with everybody? I move to appoint Diana Linscog to the library board. Second. I motion second. Discussion. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed. Motion ha carries. Thank you. Wanted to let you I just had a question about uh, uh, going back to the uh, yeah. budget committee appointment. Will there be a chance to maybe uh, go one on one to, because uh, I think he missed the orientation. Yeah. Right. So there, there will, we've, uh, I've already talked with staff and uh, we'll, we'll work another orientation um, available. Does that fill up budget committee? I still have one more to work on, and I've got some people I'm working on. Um, also in your packet is a proclamation where I'll be declaring Arbor Day. <laughs> Yay trees. <laughs> because we are a tree city, is that correct? It's growing on us. Yes, it is. <laughs> We're branching out. <laughs> it's rooted in our history. <laughs> I will leave this away alone. Thank you for the oxygen <laughs> trees. <laughs> Was I needling you? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Just planting seeds. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, under uh, additional reports, I did want to let you know um, I participated in the LOC, the recent LOC board meeting, and we've had uh, extensive conversations about what the legislature is trying to pass um, uh, that has pretty significant impact on cities. I did want to let you know. Um, city staff have been helpful, and we've communicated with our legislators our concerns uh, about some of the uh, elimination of zoning, uh, uh, elimination of single family zoning, and uh, uh, there's been some movement, but it's going to be really challenging. There's also some additional uh, uh, legislation that would uh, impact enterprise zones on our and that would impact our ability to uh, uh, economic development opportunities. And uh, I think the polite thing is many folks, many legislators have no understanding of how local governments and cities work. I think that's as polite as I can be. Um, had. Uh, uh, extensive conversations as have staff with uh, Representative Evans and let him know and uh, we've spoken to some other people so I just wanted to keep you folks informed about that um, with that um, I'm going to turn it over to our city manager for uh, his report and uh, good evening nice to see you <laughs> good evening Mary <laughs> Um, so I uh, just kind of wanted to go over a few things. I, I have a few more than the normal, but um, that's just because we've had a fair amount going on. So uh, to talk a little bit about uh, the river. Um, the river's rising. Uh, I, I sent you um, kind of a, a sneak peek uh, last uh, week, uh, at the end of the week, that uh, the river was going to come up. At that point in time, um, it looked like it was going to stay below the action level. Um, but Monday morning, we found out that that wasn't going to be the case, um, which is typical once they get um, river gauge flows and they kind of get better information about how much snow melt's going to be coming down, um, they have a better idea what's going to happen. So that really kicked um, our public works uh, crew into gear. We knew it was going to be uh, below the, uh, the flood stage, the minor flood, flood stage, but we knew it was going to be above the action level. So um, public works immediately started um, putting the word out. They, they let uh, me know, I let you know. Um, we also put uh, stuff out on social media to let uh, other people know that the uh, event was coming and that we were getting prepared for that. Um, they started uh, inventorying the, the sand, the sandbags they have. They were topping off fuel generators. They were uh, making sure that their equipment and the truck fleet was prepared uh, for anything that was going on. Um, for those who don't know, uh, right outside of City Hall, um, across the parking lot from the police department is um, a sandbag station. We have uh, 
shovels and sand um, sandbags. So if the event ever does get to that point, some people need sand, they can come. It's uh, free for them. They can fill the sandbags, take them off the way, and, and do what they need for them. Um, other things that they did is they started checking uh, culverts, grades, and storm structures for debris, making sure, especially um, in Ash Creek and other places, there weren't debris that was uh, blocking uh, the, the channels um, and that things were, were flowing freely. Uh, we knew um, that that was uh, important. Um, and probably the most important thing they did is they went out and they removed the dock section, dock section from the um, from the uh, boat ramp. Uh, that uh, that has to get out of there before it gets 18 feet, or it's really hard to get out. Um, so they got down there and they got uh, those sections out of the water so that they didn't get damaged. Um, they started closing parks, and from then on, they kind of went into more of a monitoring um, situation. Uh, one of the things that Public Works is doing um, is they have a, um, a standard operating procedures which they operate on, and a lot of their standard operating procedures have been um, uh, institutional knowledge, and so they're working very hard to try to start to document um, exactly what river levels impact different areas and different parks along the river, uh, to what extent. Um, and so they're learning and they're continuing to document. Uh, they took a lot of pictures at this time. They documented a lot of stuff. They found out some things like, yeah, you need to get the porta potties out of the parks um, before the water gets too high. Um, <laughs> and so another thing to add to the uh, standard operating procedures. But, uh, you, you know, really, I think they're, they're polishing up what they're doing and creating a really solid checklist so they don't have to rely on institutional knowledge and they can make sure that they hear it. Like so uh, kudos to them for doing that. Um, did you guys have any questions about the flood or any conversations before I move on? Not a flood. But, um, Not a flood, just a, river, a river slight river. rise of water. I just want to uh, compliment uh, city staff on um, letting people know up front that, you know, the park is, uh, our new park parts, was it was planned to be wet because we know the water does rise occasionally and so it was planned in and I know I saw some comments that people, oh, it was planned for. Okay, makes good. The city's and, smart. Yeah, they, 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 <laughs> and, I, and I did enjoy, and I haven't been able to find it, but when I was here for a meeting recently, uh, I saw the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Ospreys with their, um, the, little, the little bubbles I had with. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, <laughs> Jason uh, Kistler on our staff made a little mem that we put up on Twitter. <laughs> that was, uh, and, that, and that was cute, and, and I think uh, that's uh, uh, another, it's a great example of letting people know, plan for, work, normal expectation, and that was really helpful because that lets other people go, oh yeah, it's just a, it's a plan for thing, and you know, sometimes you boat in the amphitheater, but you know, what's a multi-purpose area. Yeah, it is, and you know, we, we're seeing, uh, you know, we, we won't know until the water goes down what the, what the park is like, and we've, we certainly have planned for it, and I think that the majority of the park will be fine except for a little mud and, and some bark that floated away. Uh, but we are seeing some, some flows out there towards the point on one of the end where we might get some erosion and some stuff that we need to think about a little bit more, but we'll see. Um, but for the, for the most part, yeah, you're right. That Thank you. Be, uh, Appreciate it. Continue. Um, I just wanted to give you an update on um, uh, the MyNet financing and the acceleration of uh, the equipment there. Um, I think that uh, we passed a, a motion um, at the last council meeting to basically uh, make sure that MyNet had these resources they needed to accelerate that project. Um, it, it turned out that MyNet was not able to, to get the, the, the funding and it also turned out that they're not able to get all of the equipment in the schedule that they had initially proposed. So what that does for this year budget is it actually gets us back much closer to where um, we had it in the budget. We were looking at, you know, over $100,000 of an impact to, to this fiscal year budget. That's probably going to be around $15,000 um, at what we're looking at now. So, so very minor. It's going to delay their ability to get all of the users um, online, but I think they're going to have the, the majority of them online in, in, in good time. So um, I just wanted to give you an update on that since uh, things have changed uh, since we, we talked last. Um, I also wanted to give you an update on the, the um, bank funding for the water uh, fund that we uh, approved a few council meetings ago. That was um, an $800,000 loan from Chase Bank. Um, we put some squishy language in there about uh, the rates and, and exactly who we were going to go with, and that was because 
we wanted to take advantage of other opportunities. We found something better than um, Chase at three and a half percent. And um, interest rates have been actually coming down uh, pretty significantly. So we were actually able, when we find a close on that, to get a rate of 2.65 percent, um, which saved thousands and thousands of dollars um, over the, the, the course of that loan. It's still with Chase. And uh, they're actually going to fund that tomorrow. So we'll have the money um, in our bank to, uh, tomorrow morning. That's what I'm hearing. So, so uh, job well done to Gloria and, and our, our, uh, our bond council for, for pursuing that and, and for Chase for coming alongside and giving us a better <coughs> when they were. So, so when does the deal close? Uh, tomorrow morning. Okay, they will. Okay, it will be tomorrow morning. Okay, good. So, um, I just wanted to kind of give you a, a sneak preview of something that I'll, I'll probably um, talk about a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to send you a, a document. I'm also going to publish it on Facebook so that the public can have it. Um, but it was uh, some uh, webinar that I attended. Um, the mayor actually sent me a link to it. And it's, uh, it was entitled, Can We Save Recycling? Um, and it was put on by a governing um, uh, the governing group and um, the Republic services so it had a little bit of a, a, a tilt towards uh, the industry side of things but it was actually really fair and, and well done and um, I think it's just a really good read it's really well laid out and I think it explains some of the issues that they're seeing um, I guess what it convinced me of more than anything is, is we put a little bit of a surcharge on the recycling um, because we needed to and it, it's pretty clear that this is not going to be a short-term uh, issue that's going to go away anytime in the near future. Um, and I think as a state and as a city and other places, we're going to have to think um, more about what we're going to do um, in recycling in the future. Uh, you know, back in the 70s, uh, when the programs kind of started, it was one of those um, where governments and other agencies had to come in to incentivize and to um, encourage or uh, make the program happen. And for a long time, it kind of just ran on its own because there was enough um, money in the program and enough uh, receipts from things to mm -hmm. pay for most of the recycling that was being done. And so the program kind of ran on its own. And we're in a situation now where that's just not the case. There's no money in glass anymore. There's no money in mixed paper anymore. Um, you know, other than metals and cardboard even, it's just about barely breaking even anymore. So um, that along with the decision to commingle all of the uh, recycling and the contamination that came along with that and the fact that so many of those projects or, or products that go into that are no longer profitable is really creating some challenges for the recycling industry and and so i think it's a good read for you to kind of get some ideas of your mind wrapped around it because this is going to be an issue we're going to have to deal with for for a fair period of time um, the Osprey camera is, uh, you've probably seen a few images of that, that was one we used for our Twitter. We would love to have that as a live stream, um, but we just don't have the connectivity to that right now. Uh, we will once the hotel is finished and we can have reliable service there, uh, but we, we want to make sure that we have a good signal and that it is a good channel. So it'll probably be after the hotel opens before that camera is live. Um, there is a pair up there. Um, and uh, it's great to see them back and to, to be a part of our community. Um, Babies will be breaking out all over. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yes, um, uh, we, we will definitely get that camera up at some point in time where uh, people can live stream that. Um, and, and one thing that kind of goes along with that is, is I've been talking with MyNet a little bit about um, trying to create a partnership with them to provide some free Wi-Fi in our parks. Um, uh, certainly something that a lot of other communities have done and something that um, we could do on our own, but we're, we're talking about maybe partnering with them to kind of create um, consistent um, Wi-Fi connectivity. We bring stuff in for, for big events and stuff, but then it leaves. Um, if we had Wi-Fi out there, then we would have an Osprey camera that ran all the time, um, but we don't. So that's something we're, we're working on one way or another. Um, last item that I have is we had a joint uh, historic planning Preservation Committee meeting and Planning Commission meeting. And um, finally, we are seeing that um, language move forward. I think we're at the point uh, after that meeting where um, we are going to provide notice. We're going to have a legal review done. We're going to get the staff report finished. And uh, we'll schedule a meeting for the Planning Commission to hear that. That will ultimately end up um, in front of you guys. Um, but uh, I think we're in good shape to actually get some new code um, in place and move that project forward. 
And then I do have one last thing. Um, it was just uh, actually going to have Sean come up and talk about um, the I-6 grant that he submitted um, uh, last week. This uh, was uh, a, a big project for Sean, um, which says a lot because Sean can get a lot done in a, in a short period of time. Um, but uh, I want to give Sean a lot of kudos. He, he put together something that I think very few people in the state could actually do um, just because of the relationships that he um, has and because of all the hard work that he's accomplished um, over a long period of time. So with that, I'll let Sean kind of explain that to you and then I think he has the next agenda item as well. Welcome. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mayor and Council. Um, well, yeah, Tom's right. Um, I just recently submitted this uh, I-6 challenge grant. It's a federal grant through the Economic Development Administration. Um, you may recall back in January, we found out that we were one of nine rural communities uh, nationwide that was selected out of over 130 that applied uh, to the Center on Rural Innovations Rural Innovation Initiative. Uh, and the, the, the upshot of that was they were working with these rural communities to help them develop a, an innovation hub strategy and uh, apply for this I-6 uh, program. Um, the thinking being that these federal grants can be very difficult and complex and rural communities don't typically have the either you know, manpower or expertise to really be able to pull the, the, the applications together. Um, yeah, so we did uh, submit a proposal to develop a smart rural innovation hub here uh, centered on independence but with a potential impact uh, really kind of within, you know, within kind of the surrounding three county area. Um, it's in many ways an extension of what we've already been doing, um, working with universities and entrepreneurs to do pilot projects around smart agriculture and smart, and smart city uh, solutions, um, but taking that the next step and doing uh, kind of community challenge events, what we call reverse pitch competitions and hackathons where you get, for example, the farmers to come in and say, I've got, you know, here's this problem, if somebody would just solve this problem, I would pay you know somebody to you know for this solution and I know all of my friends would do this and you have technologists and entrepreneurs and people in the audience who say all right we're going to form teams and see if we can develop a conceptual solution for this that could turn into a business um, from there you know so we're developing the entrepreneur entrepreneurial side of it as well um, but then also focusing on the workforce uh, and working with you know through the makerspace uh, and other local in the library and other local organizations to really try to make sure that our local folks have the skills needed to be able to start the businesses and, and ideally take these jobs that are created as a result um, as the economy moves into this, you know, the kind of the digital economy transition. So real quick, I wanted to kind of call out some of the partners because we had, uh, I think it was a baker's dozen letters of support uh, for this, uh, this project. Um, first, the state of Oregon and business Oregon uh, worked really hard to actually get us a $125,000 commitment of cash to match this project. We were asking for $650,000. Um, that was a very, very fast turnaround for them, um, and they really made it happen. The regional solutions uh, coordinator and, their, and their, their team was very helpful, um, and it was great to see that kind of support for a community like ours. Um, they really see this as an opportunity to create a model for other rural communities to follow. Um, Oregon State University and their accelerator program have, have all um, offered to contribute a lot of, of in-kind services, uh, research, grad students, uh, programming for entrepreneurship, the Small Business Development Center similarly, as well as the Merit Program. Uh, Indy Commons was a great resource as well, a potential home for the work. Community Services Consortium with the Makerspace, Technology Association of Oregon, uh, as connections to the industry and really a lot of expertise on how you run these types of events that I was talking about. Um, this is again, you know, I've never done this kind of stuff before, but we know people who have, and so we can bring them in to, to work with us. The Council of Governments uh, provided a lot of support, the library, as I said, uh, and even Representative Evans provided a letter of support really kind of outlining why he thinks this is an important thing, uh, project to work on. So, you know, it just goes to show, you know, we really, um, as a community, have been very good at reaching out, <coughs> building relationships, you know, developing our network, this is an opportunity to kind of bring it all together into a cohesive um, project and program that if it gets funded, it's a three-year, uh, give us a three-year runway to work on this. I think we can do some pretty impressive stuff if, if it works out. That's the very, very short version. Wow. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. When, when will the decision be made? On the uh, July-ish. Okay. Well, the fact that uh, uh, Business Oregon, uh, through the governor's office, uh, was able to provide some resources that uh, uh, those things just don't happen and uh, yes you've made good friends in lots of places and uh, our community is better for it I should also say it's you know 
it's based on prior experience and prior our track record. You know, we didn't just walk in and say, you don't know us, but this is a great idea. They looked back at everything we've done here in this community for the last 20 years and said, yeah, and, you know, it's worth investing in this community. Great. Well, thank you very much. That That's wonderful. Great job. And all the way around. I'm going to let you roll into the next item, if that's okay with you. Sure. So uh, next one is uh, <clears throat> kind of a fun one we've been looking forward to for a while, Vision 2040. Uh, you, you know, we've talked about it a couple of times. Um, everything that we've done with these last 20 years has been based around community-wide visioning and action planning. Uh, it's time to launch the next program. Um, so we're, I want to give you a quick rundown on the, the, the plan of how we're going to do some community engagement and how this is going to go. Um, please, you know, I'm going to be a little vague on some of it because it's really intended to be uh, a flexible, evolving uh, process, and, you know, especially dependent on the, the advisory committee and the, and the community because it needs to be community driven. So we're just getting ready to send out, uh, start sending out invitations for a steering committee. We want a, a very representative advisory committee to help kind of guide this process, review, uh, review documents, but especially kind of give us feedback on how to do outreach, where to go do outreach, and then help us get there. Um, what we wanna do is have a, a launch event um, on or around May 14th. Um, the idea would be something, something fairly simple like an ice cream social or a pie social, something like that. Um, but that would be the, the time to sort of uh, begin distributing things like, you know, we're going to have a survey, we're going to have um, uh, materials about what is the process and how you can get involved and, in, 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 you know, kind of, we're going to have a, a whole menu of different ways that people can participate and then if they want to, they could then get other people to participate. Uh, we're going to have a, we're calling it a, a living room visioning kit that you can kind of take home and, you know, do stuff with your family to kind of figure out what, what your family wants to do and then offer that as input. Um, and we want to spend really kind of the late spring and all the way through summer just getting out there and talking to as many people as possible, getting input from as many people as possible. Um, we, you know, we want to be tabling things like a, a summer series. We want to maybe have some block parties where, uh, you know, ideally steering committee members say, hey, I'm willing to host something in my neighborhood. You know, we buy the, the, the hot dogs and, uh, and soda and everybody gets together and the neighborhood comes and we just mostly have fun, but also say, you know, what do you think about this, that, and that, you know, and just get some real basic um, input from these folks. Um, we're, uh, I mentioned survey. Uh, one of the other things that I'm, I'm kind of excited about is we're going to do a, a um, it's not quite a contest, but a picture challenge where we essentially say, look, get out there and take, a, take pictures of, you know, we haven't figured out the right kind of way to frame it yet, but, you know, you know take pictures of what's working in this community or what you want to see more of or what you want, would like to see improved. You know, and then we want to use that as an opportunity for visual input from all members of the community. And then in the final document, ideally, we want to be able to use many of those pictures to illustrate some of the projects or some of the ideas that we are that we're talking about. Um, so we've got a lot of a lot of different you know interesting ideas about how we we're, how we're going to get out there and talk to people. We're going to work a lot with Ramon, the community engagement manager, uh, make sure we're reaching out to the Latino community effectively, um, getting them engaged, you know, and, and, and really kind of participating in this process as well. Um, but, you know, I already mentioned it several times because it's important. We're going to be leading on that advisory committee. You know, we're going to be looking at the advisory committee to say, okay, you know, do you know people? Do you, do you know of a, of a sector of the community that we haven't been talking about? Is there an organization that we should really go and, and get in front of and speak about this? You know, where, where should we be, we be doing this? How should we be doing this? Um, that's going to be a big, uh, a big piece of all of this. So then the idea is really just kind of gather all that input over the summer. Uh, in the fall, we're going to start zeroing in and just kind of, you know, trying to put it into categories, trying to put it into short-term, medium-term, long-term. Um, our thought right now is actually to have a, I'm, gonna call it, I'm calling it a stakeholder town hall where we get essentially the potential partner organizations to come in and we, you know, kind of, explore many of these projects with these partner organizations or potential partner organizations and say, you know, what, what if, which of these align with what you guys are already doing or where you want to go or is there, is there something here that you want to help with? So that we can start, you know, not just kind of throwing mud at the wall, but really kind of being organized about, you know, yeah, there's a lot of people excited about this and hey, there's an organization that's also excited about this. That's a, that's a potential partner. We really need to make sure that one kind of you know, gets in the mix here. And that's how we're going to start really tr sort of trying to zero in on this final plan. Um, you know, we do want to have uh, some type of other you know, sort of public um, vetting before we, we finalize the plan. Like I say, that's kind of down the road far enough. We haven't really thought too closely about what that's going to look like. Um, 
uh, I actually I forgot to mention at the beginning of fall there will be an open house um, to say you know essentially like hey here's what we've heard so far you know here's here's the here's what, here's where we think things are going here's where you know kind of the the, the major areas that we're hearing about what are we, you know are we missing anything uh, is there somewhere else that we need to look before we get too much farther down the road uh, and then we're going to keep on going uh, and then really what we want to do is wrap it up uh, probably sometime January February and um, you know, I, we're again kind of just beginning to kick around ideas, but we want to kind of frame it as a celebration. We want to present this plan, all of the kind of the projects and the ideas, and then ideally get as many of these sort of partner organizations or people who feel really strongly about these projects. You know, we want to have a big room, have a party, get them, get all these folks, you know, tables around the edge of the rooms, you know, with you know a little flag or whatever, saying, you know, I'm I'm the person who really wants to get a skate park going. I'm the person who really wants to get this type of program going. And then that way, all of the community that comes to celebrate, they can also go around and say, oh, that's really interesting. I'm going to sign up as a volunteer. I know I can help them you know, complete this project in this way and use that as a direct opportunity for people to start getting engaged in these projects. Um, as you can see, I'm a little excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? I, it seems Please. like you've, you've addressed a lot of the active engagement that you're going to do what about the more passive people is there going to be any effort maybe put things in the businesses put things on the the food trucks to kind of engage those more passive people yeah and i think that's where especially with the surveys you know mm -hmm. that's we want that to be online but we we will have hard copies as well you know meetings obviously we'll have flyers and things like that mm -hmm. but i think the surveys are going to be the most kind of the easiest access way to do this mm -hmm. uh, and frankly a lot of the other the other kind of conversational out outreach that we do is going to be based on the questions on the survey because we want we want it to all be fairly in line you know we don't want you know to be asking one person about one topic and a different person about a different topic because then you can't really say you know oh yeah they both think this is really important mm -hmm. um, so that's really kind of how we're looking at doing it and you uh, did you say May 14th was the kickoff event? Yes, uh, tentatively. We're looking at potentially as a as a pre-council meeting activity, something like that. Okay, I I have an advance, a uh, little advance input for Vision 2040. Okay. I understand there's going to be a fairly large building in Central Plaza that is going to be empty. Huh? Um, let's get a clothing store in there. <laughs> I'll mark it down. I really appreciate uh, the effort that you folks have put in, and I think it's really helpful that uh, this community has gone through this process a couple of different times, and I, I recognize some of the uh, the continuing, the not themes, but uh, processes that have worked so well, uh, that have engaged so many people, because I think one of the strengths as uh, other people from around the state ask, how do you guys do all this? Is just having such a huge number of people participate, it really uh, does provide a real clear flow uh, of where, you know, when you have a thousand or more people involved, that uh, really provides uh, a real, and I really appreciate that you guys are connecting into the work that's previously been done in a process way, so thank you for that. Anything else from anybody else? Okay, I think you all, do you have the next part also? I don't think I do. Uh, yeah. Just, you just need to, on uh, 7.1, you just need to Oh, the, uh, the OLCC hearing on the Independence Grill, uh, that's going to be rescheduled to the uh, April 23rd? Okay. It, can I, may I ask, does that change how the Independence Grill can do business between now and then? No. Okay. So it's my understanding that they, um, they do have a temporary liquor license and they're able to serve right now. So Okay, because it was also my understanding that when we did that uh, OLCC approval at the high school that they were on the list. Um, I don't believe that they were on that list uh, at the high school. Um, as far as I know, I, 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 I do. Um, we did try to accelerate uh, and move them up to this meeting, but it was okay. my understanding after we took that action that they were able to get their temporary and, and, and be serving up. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Irwin. Yes, I do have the next item. There you go. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so in front of you uh, tonight is a resolution to adopt the uh, new 
Uh, Sunset Meadows Park Master Plan, you, you heard about this at the last meeting. Um, just a quick recap, you know, we had a uh, several month process with a consultant, um, a lot of public involvement, a lot of engagement uh, from the neighbors and the, the community at large about what types of uh, amenities uh, would go well in there and what folks want to see. And I think there's real pretty solid um, consensus about what the final plan is. So. Um, this resolution is really just to ensure that we are properly um, kind of codifying or adopting that plan uh, and so we can start moving forward and trying to make it happen. Questions? We discussed it for uh, the TV audience, just uh, we discussed this at length last time and had any questions in sorting that out. So this is the formalization of, uh, frankly, of the discussion from last time. If there, go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, I move to adopt resolution 19-1500, amending the city's parks and open spaces master plan by adopting an Annex D Sunset Meadow Park master plan. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? I think everybody's going yes, okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and the next item is the uh, implementation of that. <laughs> hey, we're efficient. You know, you know, not a lot of movement there. Keep rolling. So yeah, so we, um, uh, as as the way the way that we usually do, um, we try to seed a little bit of money with city funds and go out and find grants and volunteers and other folks to uh, uh, flesh out the rest of the budget for parks projects. And that's what we're looking to do here. The uh, state parks and rec department through the local government grant does have a small grant program that's a maximum of $75,000 requires a 40% match. Um, what we'd like to do is propose um, uh, using, uh, you know, I've got about $35,000 identified here in the, the staff report, but we haven't finalized, finalized the number. Um, but of Parks SDC is to again, seed the money, go out there, uh, more than double it with a grant and then ideally be able to leverage um, uh, you know, neighbors and, and volunteers to do even more work. Uh, this would be for phase one improvements, which we're identifying as you know, grading stormwater uh, drainage improvements, and then ideally to be able to get the concrete pathway, multi-use pathway uh, put through there as well. Questions? And it, yeah, I should say it is a competitive process, so obviously there's no right. under guarantees. Seems pretty straightforward. Everybody okay? I see sh shaking of heads. It is an action item if someone would so move. There we're waiting for the scroll. I move to approve resolution number 19-1501, authorizing application for a local government grant for phase one development of Sunset Meadows Park and delegating authority to the city manager to sign the application. I have a motion. Second. Second. Councilor Takas. Is there further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. We are down to announcements. Who has announcements? Please. I was contacted by a friend on the Newburgh City Council who would like to talk to Jason about the Osprey Cam. I'll get contact information for that counselor. Great. Mm -hmm. Do Wonderful. they want to do one too? They have some Osprey that they want to watch what they're doing. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Anything? Please. I don't have anything. <gasps> <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> anything from anybody else? Somebody like to send people home? Move to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? Thank you very much. Pleasant evening.